everybody? Good. Oh, you guys are good. Good. Well, my name is Kelsey Smith. Um, I have the honor of overseeing worship, first impressions, and our awesome youth group here at New Life. But today, I get to do one of my favorite things, and that is preach to you out of the Word of God. And like it was said, we're in the series of James today, and we are in James chapter 3. But I know that as you come in, our goal here at New Life is not that you would just meet us. Because we know that if, if we're all that you encounter this morning, at some point, you will probably be let down. Because we're humans trying our best to run God's church. And so our hope is that at some point this morning, you would encounter the presence of God. Because we know that through one worship song, through one word spoken, through something in his word, you can be forever changed in an instant by the presence of God. So would you pray with me this morning before we start? God, we love you. We give you everything that we have, and we know that your presence is in this place. So I pray that you would speak directly to each one of us, that your spirit would fall. God, that you would whisper in the way that only you do exactly what you need us to hear this morning. We give this to you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, like I said, we're in a series walking through the book of James. And like Dan has taught us, James was Jesus' brother. So he had the most up-close, front, personal view of what Jesus was like. And last week we learned about our faith and about if we have a dead, a demonic, or a dynamic faith. And Dan encouraged us in different ways that we can step forward into that dynamic faith. But today we are in what I believe is one of the toughest chapters of James to, sw to swallow. If you look at James chapter 3, the heading of the chapter says, Taming the Tongue. And when I was told, this is the chapter you're preaching on, I thought, that's hilarious. <laughs> because if anyone really knows me, it's a joke that I have the largest HR file on staff here at New Life because I like to tell jokes like a 12-year-old boy. It's why I'm really gifted, I believe, at leading the youth because I'm just like them. I also am very, very sarcastic, very sarcastic. And when people ask me, how can I be praying for you? Where are you struggling? My number one answer is a desire to gossip. And people may say like, well, that's not that big of a sin, right? Because as Christians, we kind of level our sins. We have level 10 sins. And, and if you think with me about what a level 10 sin might be to you, I know you're thinking murder, right? Adultery. These are what we think of our level 10 sins. Then maybe level five is like boasting, bragging, gossip. But if you look in the book of Proverbs at what God says the six most detestable things are to him, three of those have to do with the taming of your tongue. Three of those, bearing false witness, being deceptive, gossiping. God hates when we don't use our tongue to build up his people. So I want to tell you right now, as one of, my, one of my favorite preachers says about this chapter, you might want to pick your toes up off the floor because they're about to get stepped on. But I want to tell you, you're in good company because as I was preparing this this week, I stepped on my own toes quite a bit. But we're going to start by reading through this whole section in James chapter 3, if you have your Bible. I actually told Dan this morning, I said, I can't find James. It's really hard to find in here. I don't know what it is. It's a small book. It hides. It's between Hebrews and 1 Peter. So we're in James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be more strictly judged. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. He's not messing around about this. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no man, no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. 
With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So today we're going to talk about how to tame our tongue. But first we're going to talk about what is the power in our words. For you note takers, I have three points for you about the power of our words. And the first is that my words determine the direction of my life. Just like we saw in the beginning in James 3, 3 through 4, it says, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So he talked about bits in the mouths of horses. This is my daughter, Harper. She's seven. And while we tried to get her to enjoy a lot of different things, like gymnastics or t-ball or different things that little girls do, the one thing that she is stuck with that she loves is horseback riding. She absolutely loves it. But a few months ago, she fell off her horse, Callie. This is Callie. Callie is 18 hands tall, so that means 18 of these bad boys up. And you see Harper, who's about yay tall, riding Callie, a 55-pound girl on a 1,500-pound horse. And when she fell off Callie, it was terrifying, right? Because that's a long distance to topple. I fell off a horse once, side note, at a graduation party. That was really fun. And my dad stood there and said, good roll, Kel, good roll. So I don't ride horses anymore. But Harper is very brave. And it took her a long time to get back up on this horse because 55 pounds compared to 1,500 pounds with 18 hands, you might feel a little out of control. But how does Harper control Callie? Let's look at this next picture. She holds the reins, right? But down at the bottom of the reins in Callie's mouth is a piece of metal that sits in her mouth. I was going to get it today and let Dan show you how it goes in his mouth, but I figured he wouldn't like that. And it sits in her mouth, right? And as Harper pulls the reins to the left, Callie's entire body will go to the left. If she pulls the reins up, Callie stops. If she pulls to the right, Callie goes to the right. Our tongues are just like bits in the mouths of horses. One comment, one word to someone that may have not been thought through before it comes out of our mouth can steer the whole direction of their life. All of us sitting in this room are the culmination of words that have been spoken over you. When I asked the staff on Wednesday, what words of life had been, had been spoken over you? What has someone prophesied over you? And you know what happened? This. It was dead silent. And I said, all right, let's start with the other. What words of death? And immediately, each one of them knew exactly what had been spoken to them that was hurtful. They told stories upon stories of just maybe one little sentence that then crushed the way they saw themselves. For me, I can remember sitting in my seventh grade choir classroom and a girl looking at me and saying, are you related to the moon? Because you have craters in your forehead. I had chicken pox when I was a baby and I still have pox scars in my forehead. It may be something that some of you haven't even noticed, but you know, it's the first thing I still see when I look in the mirror those marks in my forehead. I had a boyfriend in high school say, it ain't over till the fat lady sings, so hold your tongue. And so now, every time when I work out, I have to fight the thought of, you're working out because it ain't over till the fat lady sings. Instead, no, I'm working out so that I can be a good mom, healthy for my kids, and because they say I'm grumpy if I don't. <laughs> right? You know it. Dan's like, amen. <laughs> Words of death. You're probably all sitting here thinking through, what was mine? What was mine that I still have to fight to overcome? Words of life. When I was in eighth grade, I went to Camp Wakeshma. I know some of you actually just got back from Camp Wakeshma, and you are way braver than me. Because I went in eighth grade and was so homesick on the first night that I crawled into the bunk of my friend, and then the next morning I told the camp counselor, I got to go home. This is not worth it. I am miserable. I was in eighth grade, you guys. That's highly embarrassing. 
Eighth grade, I had to go home. And you know what the camp counselor said to me? Instead of, stick it out, you're fine, you can do this. He said, this quality in you is what's going to make you great at working with kids in the future. Because you are going to have empathy for them in a way that others don't. And so I went home not ashamed of the fact that I had to leave. I went home empowered thinking, I'm going to be great at working with kids. And when I went to interview for my first job teaching choir at Matawan, you know the person who was actually sitting in that room was the dean of students who used to be the head counselor at Wakeshma, who was the one who spoke those words of life over me. I will forever be thankful to Nate Ingalls for believing in me enough to speak words of life in a season that could have been really embarrassing. Another time, my brother and I were actually at a worship night at our old church, and the pastor looked at us, and he said, when I see you guys, I don't know what it is, but I see Miriam and Moses. I see people called to join together to lead people into the promised land. And so every time as Satan attacks me when I stand on this stage and I say, Dan, are you sure you don't want to do it today? I'm a little nervous. This is a new stage. These are some new people. And I hear that voice. When I see you, I see Miriam and Moses called to lead people into the promised land. And I say, okay, God, I know you've got me. If you spoke to someone else to speak that word of life to me, you've got me. Our words determine the direction of our lives. We even see that in the Bible. In Numbers, we have a story of Caleb being told to go look and see if they can take over Canaan. They're headed to the promised land, and he and some men were sent to see if they could do it. Now, Caleb, it says, silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we certainly can do it. But what did the other people say? Oh, sorry. Sorry. But, with the men, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. So even in the Bible, you have that positive, the positive report for surely we can take them. We have God on our side. And then you have the men saying, we can't do that. They're, like, they're jacked. We can't go. They're going to take us out, right? And so we see if Caleb wouldn't have had that positive report, if people wouldn't have listened to the direction of what Caleb was saying, the whole trajectory of the Bible might have looked a little different. But because his words determined the direction of their lives. Number two, my words can destroy what I have. In James, it says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. The tongue is like a small spark. So in my preparation this week, I started looking up great forest fires. I don't know why. It just seemed fitting. What are some great fires that we've seen? And I came across the story of the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Dan and I love to go to Chicago for date nights. It's really fun. A little getaway, only two hours, right? But in 1871, the whole city was set on fire. It says that it burned 3.3 square miles, killed over 300 people, and left 90,000 people homeless. You know how it started? A man named Lois Cohn was playing an illegal card game in a wooden building and got caught and ran out, and the lantern tipped. One spark decimated an entire city. That one tipping of the lantern led to 3.3 square miles totally crushed. But something really interesting, when I looked up, how did it spread so fast, right? How did they not just take it out immediately? There were three things that led to the spreading. Now, you're going to have to stick with me because I'm going to try my best to explain this really clearly. First was that they were in a season of drought which we are apparently not in right now. <laughs> you guys don't have to worry about Kalamazoo today. We're covered. They were in a season of drought. Two, there were strong winds that gusted in and spread it. And three, there was the deconstruction of the water pumping system. So I think if my one spark, my one negative comment on Facebook, my one gossip about someone that is maybe meant to sound like a prayer request, am I preaching or meddling? Bless her heart, she just told me this, and I need some advice, right? But, but maybe we just want to talk about it. That one spark then led by a drought, because if that came out of my mouth, there was a drought in my heart. We're going to talk about that later, about how what comes out of the tongue is actually what started in the heart. 
If I'm not in the word, if I'm not spending time with God, if I'm not around fellow people who build me up, there's probably going to be a drought in my heart that then leads to that spark. Strong winds. Who are you surrounding yourself with? When I get in a fight with Dan, do I have friends that say, oh, girl, go get him. He's not good enough for you, that just add those wins. Or do I have friends that say, hey, have you prayed about this and maybe seen where you're wrong? Who are you surrounding yourself with that maybe give strong wins to that spark and make it start to blaze? The deconstruction of the water pumping system. What are we seeing right now with the church? We're seeing the deconstruction of the church at large. Who's the living water in the Bible? Jesus. So what's the water pumping system in our age today? The church, right? Our hope is to pump the living water into more and more people so that they can experience Jesus. But if we have that spark that is started by a drought in our heart, the negative word, and then we have those strong winds, winds of friends who are maybe saying, yeah, keep talking, go get them, get after them, or maybe they're adding to your comments on Facebook and it's not life-giving, and then you don't have a church built on the Bible and the firm foundation of Jesus to then redirect you when you've got it wrong, we're going to light the city on fire. And it's not going to be for the better, it's because of that one comment that we couldn't quite hold back. We couldn't tame our tongue. In Proverbs, I believe is where we're at. Yep, 18:21, it says, "The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences." I love to talk. But sometimes my talking gets me in trouble and can destroy my life. Point three: my words always reveal my heart. And I just started talking about that with the drought in our heart. We'll see this in James. It says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. So we're praising God. We come to church. We're singing. We're praising God. He's so good. Then we go home, and we're bashing someone to the ground. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My words reveal my heart. And I will say that God challenged me with this up front and personal this week. On Sunday night, I didn't realize that I had been holding offenses in my heart, building up. I was hurt. And I was offended. And what is Satan's number one bait that he uses? Offense. I was holding on to offense, and all of a sudden, one text made it bubble out. Right? It's like I was polluting inside and then toxins came out. And I just, Dan paused the TV show and was like, what is wrong with you? Because my mouth, I was not taming my tongue. And then not only that, not only did I talk to Dan, then I got out my phone and my thumbs were going crazy. What was coming out was revealing my heart. That I had not spent time in the word. That I had not gone directly to this person and saying, hey, you probably don't even know. But I'm hurt. And I'm holding on to offense. It was revealing my heart. And then again this week, God in his goodness said, I'll give you one more chance to get it right. Doesn't he often do that? I'll give you one more chance, one more trial, and see if you can respond better. Dan and I, we often share, Dan and I can fight. So if you're thinking like, oh, of course, they're the pastor and the wife and they don't fight, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but we, we can really fight. We've gotten so much better because we see a counselor, we're spending time in the word, but we're both really passionate people, if you can't tell. So we got into it, and my first thought was, I'm going to text my sister, right? I'm going to text my sister and say, listen to what Dan did, and then she's going to build me up and say, go get him, take him out. No, that's not what she would say. <laughs> but I don't know, she'd say something. And I was like, I'm going to text my sister, and then immediately I froze. I said, this is revealing your heart. And so instead, I stopped and I started praying. I said, God, speak to each one of us. Using my tongue, right, for good. Speak to each one of us and show us where we're wrong. And not five minutes later, I got a text from Dan that was, we need to continue talking about this. And before we went to bed that night, we were okay because we had talked about it. And I didn't then have to go back to my sister and say, listen, I know you said all of this, but then Dan apologized in this way, and then this happened, and this happened, and this happened. But then she's still mad at him because she's protective of me. You guys know you've done that. It's terrible. Then you have to go, like, help fix all the bridges you've burned just by running your mouth. My words always reveal my heart. So what are we going to do? 
Because in the Bible, it says that man can tame beasts, but no man can tame the tongue. So what do we do? First, we have to, oh, I skipped part of that, allow God to change our hearts. It has to work from the inside out. Let's check out the scripture for this. It says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. We have to allow God to change our hearts. We sang the song this morning, It Is Well. I want to tell you a story about a man named Horatio Spafford, and some of you may already know this story. This was a man who was actually severely affected by the fire I told you about in point two, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. He lost everything in that fire along with his job, and at the same time, his four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. Thinking, i got to do something else for my wife and my three kids, he sent them on a boat to England for vacation. He receives a telegram from his wife when she gets to England saying, I am the only survivor, what should I do? Their three kids were in a shipwreck and drowned. So he hops on a boat to then go be with his wife, right? He's already lost his four-year-old son, his three daughters, his job, all of his worth. And as he's crossing the ocean, the captain, knowing the story, came to Horatio and said, here is the spot where your daughters died. And it says that he was filled, you ready for this? He was filled with peace and comfort. And he got out his pen and his paper, and you know what he wrote down? When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever the lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I don't know about you guys, but to me that reveals a heart changed by God. Because if I had lost my three kids, my job, if my whole city had been burned, I don't know if today I would be able to say it is well, it is well with my soul. But because of his changed heart, he gave words that now we can sing and worship. It's easy to, to sing those and to think whoever wrote this was probably having a real good season. No, who wrote it was crossing over the gravesite of his three daughters to go see his wife who had also just lost her three daughters and her one son. It is well with my soul. What is the condition of our heart that is then coming out of our mouth? What's in the bucket, what comes out of the bucket is what was deep in the spring. Point two. Oh, oh I have a challenge for you. This is what happens when I don't have my notes, but that's okay. We're trucking. My challenge for you, Psalm 19. It says, may the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This week, I challenge you. Every day when you wake up, if there's nothing else you do, would you read and say out loud Psalm 19? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, dear Lord. We're going to cleanse ourselves from the inside out. We're going to say, God, would you take hold of my heart so that whatever comes out of my mouth builds people up, right? Encourages them. I see a church that leaves today ready to go change the world for the better with the power of your tongue. What are you saying to people? Are you calling out what you see in them that God has put deep inside of them to make them better? We could be ambassadors for God by speaking life into people and then maybe they'll believe it and then maybe we'll see it. So we start with that, right? We start with Psalm 19. God, cleanse my heart so that you can purify my mouth. But we can't expect it to stay that way. So point two is we have to put a filter on what we allow in our hearts. And I can tell you this one's frustrating because we see a lot of that one encounter with God, that one cleansing, and then what happens when we leave on Sunday and something happens? Or what happens when I go home and watch that Netflix show that I love, but I know I probably shouldn't be putting it into my heart? Or when I read the psychological thriller at night before I go to bed? Yes, I'm speaking to myself. In case if you feel called out, that's me. We have to put a filter on what we allow into our heart. You are the sum of the five people you're around. Do those people say life-giving things? Are they claiming the gospel of Jesus? We have to put a filter on what we allow in because it's almost like we pollute ourselves and then we're shocked when toxins come out. 
It's like, well, where'd that come from? It's probably what you're putting inside of you. In just this week, like we talked about, we're starting 21 days of prayer. So you have a perfect opportunity already set up for you to put a filter on what you're allowing in. Join us Monday through Friday at 6 p.m., Saturdays at 10, and we're going to seek the face of God together. And every day we can say, purify us from the inside out so that we can be ambassadors of God. And point three, oh, I think I skipped my verse. Sorry. Put a filter on what I allow in my heart. In Matthew, we have a verse that says, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. I know that during 21 days of prayer, when I get rid of Facebook, and then all of a sudden I scroll on my phone to find Facebook, and it's like, whoa, I think I'm actually addicted, right? Because I'm still looking for it even though it's gone. And then it's like, okay, maybe I should just open the Bible app because that's the only thing left on my phone. And then I'm spending time in prayer and in the Word, and all of a sudden everything about me feels lighter. When I hear someone saying something negative about someone else, all of a sudden, it doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound pleasing. Because I can tell you that on Sunday night after I started just word vomiting all of my emotions, you know what I didn't feel? I didn't feel better. I felt sick to my stomach. Because it didn't feel relief of, oh, I finally told someone else how I'm feeling. It thought, how was that that deep inside of me and I didn't know it and now it just came out to other people? And now they're seeing the condition of my heart. So 21 days of prayer. Commit right now. I have never had someone join us and fully commit and say, that was a waste of time. You know what I've heard? Why didn't I do this sooner? Everything feels better when we're committed to seeking the Lord's face together. And point three, we have to decide to speak words of life. I'm going to give you some words of life today that you can speak. But as I was praying this morning... I said, God, what do you want your people to hear? I've prepared, I've done my notes, but what's the most important thing that you want people to hear this morning? And he said, they can't speak words of life if they don't believe it first for themselves. So like I said this morning, some of you are sitting in here maybe hearing those words of death spoken over you. Maybe they're not even spoken out loud. Maybe they're words that you're saying to yourself. So first, we have to believe what the Bible says about us. And I often say that I believe that even if I was the only person on earth, God still would have sent Jesus to die for me because he loves us that much. And so my prayer this morning is that you can see Jesus' love for you that intimately, that it's not just, oh, he loves them, he loves them, but he hasn't seen what I've done. No, the words of life that he speaks in the Bible are directly for you. And once we believe those for ourselves, then they can overflow into others because you can believe that for other people too. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. How can you love your neighbor if you don't love yourself? If you're holding on to those words of death, then it's really hard to believe words of life for someone else. One of the words that you can speak to people is affirmation. In the Bible, there's two times when God spoke directly to Jesus. I think they talked every day, but there's only two that are put into Scripture for us to see. They were at the Mount of Transfiguration and the baptism of Jesus. And you can see it in Matthew when it says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And the exact same thing was said again at the Mount of Transfiguration. How often do I look at Dan and I say, You are my husband, who I love, and with whom I am well pleased. Or how often do I look at my kids, You are my daughter, and I love you, and I am well pleased with you. I can say for both Dan and I, You're our church family. We love you. And we are so well pleased with you. That didn't hurt anybody's feelings, did it? That doesn't make anyone leave feeling less than. But some of you might have grown up never being told how loved you were, so it's hard, right? I've heard stories of people say, my dad never told me he loved me. I grew up in a home that, like, when I woke up, if I took two steps and then I walked back in the room, my mom was like, remember, I love you. 
Like it was all the time to the point that you kind of took it for granted, right? I say it, my friends can vouch that it's like every day, love you, just remember, love you, proud of you. It's one of my favorite things to do because I grew up in a home that that was just normal. But have you ever said it to someone who isn't used to receiving it and they're like, thanks. (laughs) We need to get used to sharing those words of affirmation. What about words of encouragement? There's a scripture that says, Ephesians 4, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Hey, dream team, those of you who came in early this morning to set the entire table for everyone else coming in to eat, I'm so proud of you. Those of you who have served for seven years portable, Those of you who started by pulling an entire trailer full of stuff to the Fetzer Center to unload it. Those of you who sat behind Pro Presenter for years never being seen. Those of you who serve daily to make sure that the church is open, that people can come. I'm so proud of you. Thank you for being the dream team that makes the dream come alive in this church. At every birthday dinner that we have for our family, we have like 16 people in our family and we celebrate everyone's birthday separately. That's more than once a month, just so you know. But we go around, oh, we have twins, so that's 15 times. But we go around and say everything we love about that person. Everything that we've seen in them that year that is so amazing. And you know what happens to me when I leave after my birthday? (sighs) Like I can, I can take it on. I've got this, right? If others see that in me, surely I can be that. And the last one is words of faith. I don't need to sit here and tell you today who you are in this moment because I'm pretty sure you're aware. You're aware of what you did last week. You're aware of what your past years looked like. I need to tell you that who in the Bible God says you can be. We need some words of faith being spoken into people as we leave this building so that they can feel empowered to be who God says they can be, not who they are right in this moment. Hey, Kelsey, you're really nervous standing on that stage. You forgot a few scriptures. Maybe you didn't even know where it came out of in the Bible and you couldn't find James this morning. No, hey, God is gonna use you as his vessel to maybe just bring one word of hope to someone. How different do we feel when people speak words of faith into us? And if you look in the Bible, you may say you're unlovable, God says you were lovable enough to send his only son. You may say you're abandoned. God says you're adopted. You may say that you're filled with anxiety, peace, and worry, but he says, or with anxiety and worry, but with him, he says you are peace-filled. You may feel hopeless, but you know that you, the Bible says, you have the hope of eternity. You may feel like you're not enough, but he says you are everything to me because you are child of the most high God. Let's speak faith to one another and believe it for ourselves. Would you pray with me? God, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for the words that you've given us in your love letter to us in the Bible that we can take hold of and we can cling to even when we don't feel it. God, I pray that our mouths would be filled with words of life, that our hearts would would not be in drought, that we would be overflowing with fresh water that comes only from you. God, I pray that if there's anyone in this room right now that has never fully believed in the power of your word or has never grasped the fact that you died for them, that they would have the opportunity this morning to turn towards you. If that's you and you say, I felt God knocking on my heart, the Bible says, that he knocks. He will make himself known to you. He will say, today is your day. And I'm gonna encourage you to be brave today and to put your faith in Jesus. This is a decision that you will never regret. To say, God, you are Lord of my life. I turn from my ways and I turn to you. So I'm gonna give you that opportunity on the count of three. I'm not gonna ask you to stand up and come to the front, but I'm simply gonna ask you to raise your hand so that between you and God, you can make that covenant with him. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed, no one looking around. One, two, three. Would you raise your hand in the air if you are ready to make that personal decision 
with Jesus. And we are all going to say this out loud together because we confess with our mouths what everyone say, God, I need you. I give you my life. I make you Lord of my life. Would you come live inside of me? I repent of my ways and I turn and I follow you. I love you, Jesus, and it's in your name I pray. Amen.